Yeah, uh, he said give me 30 seconds and it's been a minute and a half, but I thought he wanted to operate the AV, so it's kind of waiting on him. Um, this talk is MongoDB First Steps. It is designed for people who are newcomers to Mongo. If you use Mongo for a long time, you'll probably find things repetitive. However, it's always a, a new perspective with other people talk about it, so it might, you might pick something interesting. Um, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. I, um, well, I'll introduce myself a little later. Um, generally, what we're gonna go over, um, who I am, okay, I'll tell you that, and what MongoDB is, what it isn't, uh, why should you use it, or reasons why you might want to use it. Um, kind of how it works, uh, not too deep technical, just uh, general things to know about it that will help you maybe understand and choose better uh, on how, when, and in what capacity to use it. Um, maybe some pointers about where to learn more about this since this is just an introduction. Um, and we'll, we will do some demos of uh, interacting with Mongo and setting it up and if we have time, maybe some replica sets, probably not sharded. Um, and uh, answering the question, is Mongo really web scale? If you don't know this video on YouTube, uh, go watch it. There are some choice words that probably violate the code of conduct here. So it's on YouTube. I won't play it now, but it's a funny little video that came out a few years back. I'm uh, a develop, uh, developer at heart, a uh, software architect for hire. I have my own consultancy. I also do uh, videos for Pluralsight. So I have uh, four courses on Pluralsight on Mongo topics. Um, in my professional life, although I like Mongo and I use it a lot, I don't work for them. And I use it for some projects, some not. Um, I, I develop software wherever the client wants to go. So, you know, I wouldn't say it's my end all and be all that everything must be Mongo. Uh, definitely not in my professional life. But uh, it's certainly an uh, interesting technology and through its maturity, I found that it's uh, very useful uh, in many cases. So I continue to use it and I continue to, to talk about it. I just find it interesting. So is it worth my time? Should I invest my time in getting into Mongo? And the question there is, do you rely on data? And if you are, then yes. Um, Mongo is a database. Um, this is distracting, right? Uh, so Mongo is a database. Uh, as a database, it stores your data and it lets you interact with the data. Well, duh, I mean database, right? Well, you know, let's think about other offerings in the arena, right? There are some offerings that are very narrow, say, um, uh, Redis, right? So Redis stores your data, yes. Can it persist it to disk? Yes. Can you read and write data? Yes. Are you gonna use it for durability? Uh, probably no, right? You're not gonna save data for posterity into it. Kafka, write-only database, right? Uh, it, it ingests tons of data. Can you interact with it? Yes. Can you read it? Yes. Is it fast? Yes. Is it scalable? Yes. Will it save your data for posterity? Well, if you set expiration to never, yeah, I guess so. But is it a database? Can you, you know, store my running total in it? Uh, not really, right? You can create a view that, you know, aggregates all the events and in CQRS fashion shows you, but it doesn't, you know, it's not a database. Hadoop. How many people think of Hadoop as a database? Right? Is Hadoop a database? So HDFS is a file system, and some people call a file system a database. But Hadoop, again, uh, for posterity, sure, you can keep it, but it doesn't really let you change data. It, it, it's not built to interact with a record in the same way that we're used to in SQL, say, um, uh, update a record and so forth. Does it allow you to delete? Yeah, generationally you can remove blocks, but it doesn't really give you that full interaction. 
So in the class of not SQL-based databases, MongoDB is one of the more popular ones. And that's probably why you're here, because you've heard of it. And there are others, uh, some a little more purposeful, uh, more uh, narrow focused, some try to apply to a, a broader um, uh, audience. Uh, but MongoDB offers a fairly rich set of data interaction uh, primitives, commands, and ways to ingest and export data, uh, durability, scalability concerns, so it really can be used as a system of record database. Okay. Now, if you are addicted to slash more enamored with slash more uh, ready organizationally or otherwise to use another database, by all means use it. I'm not gonna spend the time right now to persuade you that it's the best. Um, I believe in it's the best for a purpose not the best overall for anything. So um, in any evaluation of any technology, you know, you'll wanna check it out, see if it works for you or not. So uh, if you wanna use another database, please do. Um, can I use my SQL skills to interact with MongoDB? Ah, interesting questions. I surveyed quickly and it didn't sound like a lot of you are data analysts or you know, information workers that just need to read or produce reports on top of databases. Um, in my later session, I have one on aggregation, which is focused on querying data out using the aggregation framework. Uh, right now, I don't think we'll touch too much into it. The short answer is uh, yes, and uh, uh, maybe you shouldn't. So uh, there are some drivers these days and translators that will talk to Mongo and, uh, and present to you a SQL compliant um, interface, ODBC driver, or something like that, and will translate for you your SQL into Mongo-ish. Uh, there are also tools to ingest tables directly into Mongo, which I highly recommend avoiding, and uh, tools to export from Mongo to uh, SQL-based um, schemas or other infrastructure, which I would say uh, it's a valid integration pattern. I see that done a lot, and there's a reason for that, right? You use Mongo for whatever it was designed, and then for other purposes where you wanna access it using regular, quote unquote, or um, heavily invested into SQL tools, you can, right? So that's a valid concern. But your SQL skills directly to Mongo, no, because it's different and it's no SQL. What does NoSQL mean? SQL is not the query language of choice there. Also, SQL is not the query language of choice for a reason. The reason is because the structure underlying the way the data is structured is not tabular. And SQL was de designed for tabular data access. So for the patterns you want to export out, I would say, yeah, by all means, go for it. For the patterns where you want to query it using SQL, uh, why not learn the lingo and access it directly how it was intended to be accessed? All right, that's a lot of hand-waving around. How do I get started with Mongo, right? That's why we're here. Well, you will need a MongoDB server. You will start it, and then uh, you need to connect to it. So as a server, it's a product that's designed to run on one or more servers. Uh, there's a way to do distributed stuff, that's called sharding, um, and then you connect to it. So your client application connects over the wire, not unlike any other database. Well, most databases, right? We have TiDB and things that are embedded. We have uh, S uh, SQLite and other kind of things that live inside your process. So Mongo definitely is designed to be a server product so that when you ask, hey, does Mongo run on my Android application? No. It's not designed for that. Really, they invested a lot in making it big and handle a lot of stuff. It's not. But wait a minute, they just announced they have something for mobile. Yes, they do, but that thing is not a full-fledged Mongo database. It's just a helpful shim so that if you're developing mobile apps, it enables you to write locally disconnected and then synchronize with the mothership big database. So overall, server designed to be big. It's MongoDB. 
the Mongo daemon. It's a process. It's compiled C++. It's shipped on your platform of choice, so you can download it whether you're running Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever, and run it. You connect to it. You create a document. What's a document? We'll talk more about it. And then you can query or update those documents. So that's kind of the life cycle in a nutshell. Let's take a quick look at just the server. So let's see, how do I do this? Um, let me stop this presentation for a sec. Okay, that looks right. Oh, still on. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, everybody see the font? Okay, great. So uh, I have um, Mongo in my path. So I have the path to the Mongo binaries. And if I want to go and see what the binaries that ship are. Uh, Mongo.d.exe is the one, the one that's uh, 3215016. So that's, that's Mongo.d, the server. Uh, that's really the only thing you ever need. Uh, if you wanted to slam copy it to a new machine and run it, you can just run it. It's as simple as that. Uh, that is the Mongo server, Mongo.d, yes sir. Um, feel free, uh, it is filmed, so I think they want some amount of lighting, um, so maybe not dark. And feel free to also come a little closer if, if it's hard to see. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's a completely different process. Uh, so. Mongod.exe is the uh, daemon, the server itself. That's what you actually interact with. It touches the data file. That's the only thing needed. Mongo S is the Mongo router. It is used in sharding. Um, and that is uh, not necessary for running a standalone. It's used when you want to scale out. Uh, that's the process that sits in front of the actual data nodes. And you'll also notice mongo.exe, that is the Mongo shell. To start MongoD, since this is a database and we want our data being persistent, what do we need to do? We need to start MongoD and tell it where to store the data. That's about the only required parameter. In fact, even that's not required because Mongo operates on a it should just work kind of principle. So under the it should just work, if you don't give it a data path, it assumes your data sits in slash data slash DB off of your root mount or root drive. So on Windows, it will be C slash data slash DB. Uh, but I can supply it a, um, a path. So I have a C temp uh, fresh directory. Uh, it's empty. Uh, so I will go ahead and, sorry. Uh, mongo d dash dash db path c temp fresh. So I'm just telling it, store the data there for me, please. And I'm starting it. And the gods of good demos shined on me. And it says, I'm ready. I have open for connection on port 27017. That's good. I started Mongo, right? In terms of installation, you know, no Java environment, no, you know, DLLs on Windows, no nothing, just the executable. That's kind of cool. No dongles, no license, no nothing since I'm using the community edition. Mongo, the company, also makes money off selling the enterprise edition, which has a few more features, and there, there's some licensing involved. But it's pretty much the same. You have MongoD exe to run, and that's about it. All right. So next, I'll uh, start another window here, and I'll connect to Mongo. 
If I don't say anything, it should just work. So when I just say Mongo, which calls the Mongo shell, Mongo D, the server, Mongo, the shell, and hit enter, it will assume I meant connect to a server. Since I didn't tell it a host name or anything, it says, well, how about localhost? I didn't tell it which port, so it says, oh, port 27017, the natural Mongo port. So I'm in. And you can see here that it presents me a nice uh, cursor where I'm in the server, I'm connected. Um, and in here, when I'm in Mongo, uh, it has a concept of namespaces, kind of like Oracle does, and a lot of databases do, actually. Uh, so when you just say DB, it echoes back to you which DB you're in. Uh, so I can switch databases. If I want to use another database, what would I say? Use, you know, demo or SVCC. And when I say that and I say DB, it says, you're in SVCC. I say show databases. Show me all the DBs. And this is a fresh database, but it already has a concept of a few databases. Those are all housekeeping. Those are all internal to Mongo. I should not write any user data to any of them. In fact, I'm prevented to write to some of them. Um, why didn't it show, yeah, why didn't it show the database I just switched to? I said use this because it's just a namespace. I haven't created any objects. No schema was created. I didn't define ahead of time or declare that I'm going to have that database. It has no clue. So it just says, okay, you want me to remember you're an SVCC? Fine. But since I haven't actually written any data, no data has been written to disk yet. Make sense? Well, let's write to disk. DB, which is my handle to the database. Um, I'm in the database SVCC. And I'll want to insert something into a collection. So in MongoDB, uh, within a database, you can have multiple collections. And collections are another piece of the namespace. Uh, and within a collection, I have documents, not tables. The documents can be anything. I'll talk about that in a bit. So I'll want to name a collection. That's kind of like naming a table, except it's not a table. So what should we call it? I don't know. Demo. And then I want to maybe insert a record. Insert. And uh, I'll say name. Sorry. Bob. Okay. Now when I say show DBs, SVCC appears. Because now I actually wrote some data. It had to persist something to disk. Behind the scenes, it created a database for me and created a collection in it. And it has a record. So if I go in, I say db.demo which is my collection dot count, it, was, it has one record in it. Fair enough? Cool. So, um, so dear diary, I started a Mongo database. I connected it to it from the shell. I created the document and uh, I can query the document too uh, we'll do a little more query uh, in just a bit. Questions so far? My collection is called demo. My document is not called, it's a record. So it doesn't have a label name. Obviously, if I wanted to query it, I would have to address some fields in it to target it directly or just say, give me everything. That's kind of the option. Yes, sir. Uh, no, and we'll get to that in just uh, 10 seconds. So what you've seen me do is you've seen me type something that looks a little like JSON, right? It, it had squiggly braces, and it had name, and a colon, and a value. Uh, the shell is written in JavaScript, but Mongo does not use JavaScript. 
Mongo uses something called BSON, uh, Binary Serialization Object Notation. And of course, like any good standard, there is a spec for it, and it is a standard, which means they made it up and they support that. Uh, but this is a very, very uh, tight uh, little fo uh, format. It is binary in that the values of integral uh, types are stored in much like the C layout, which means when it needs to parse something into the program or serialize it, it can just lay out the bytes directly. There's no big translation. If they did JSON, they would need to translate between stringified kind of um, representations into the native representation in memory, which would be a little bit of overhead. Probably over also space overhead because storing an integer is more efficient in four bytes than necessarily storing something like 65535, which is, you know, five characters, maybe six with a comma, I don't know. So anyway, so BSON is the native internal format. It is the internal format of how it's stored on disk. It is also the format of how it traverses the wire. And then you have drivers, right? So you write in Python, you write in C, you write in Java, you write in Scala, somebody writes in Go, Node.js. All of those have native drivers that Mongo, the company, supplies. Well, Mongo, the company, supports uh, a bunch of uh, major languages. There's some community drivers for more obscure or less popular language, I'd say. Uh, but, you know, if you like Perl, yes, they have a driver for that. And yes, for Go and Node.js and Java, which means Scala, and, you know, uh, Ruby and Node and C, C++, actually, um, Go, C Sharp, .NET, all that stuff. And um, one of the major competitors, CouchDB, they actually store internally. They use JSON as their document structure. Um, Mongo does not. So a question was, okay, can I store XML? You could store XML, but Mongo natively doesn't understand XML. So the thing with a document is that documents are key value pairs, right? Think a hash map, think a lookup table, whatever your language calls it. So you have fields and values. The fields are just named entries, kind of in the dictionary. And then the values are anything. Anything you ask? Yes, anything. If you wanted XML, it'll be a string of angle brackets that looks, you know, structured or unstructured or whatever. Mongo won't understand it. But all of the integral data types, integers, uh, bigger integers, meaning longs, uh, floats, decimal for accurate money, uh, date time, um, strings, uh, binary OPEC objects, UUIDs, um, what else? Booleans-ish. I mean, it is represented. It's not that efficient, but it's, it's there. Uh, what else? Yeah, so basically all the integral data types you can think of, plus you can store any arbitrary binary blob in it. So you don't have to stringify something that's blobbish for you. Like if you wanted to store a thumbnail, uh, you could just copy the buffer in. You wouldn't be able to ask Mongo, hey, what is the pixel on, you know, row 10? But you will have the whole binary thing. You're able to read it and bring it back. So it's not JSON, but it has key and values. Um, the values are strongly typed in JavaScript or, well, in JavaScript, how many types do we have in JavaScript? Three-ish. Right? We have object, we have string, we have number. That's about it, I think. I mean, there's classes that are built on top of that, but not much there. But in BSON, you have much more type fidelity, which is a tighter representation and uh, can be done and manipulated using operators and so forth. Um, and it supports lists or sets in the form of something that looks like an array. So an array in BSON 
uh, is a sequence of elements. It has order, so it is a sequence in that sense. However, it has operators that act like set operators. So you can say, hey, is foo in this list, and so forth. We'll see that in a demo. So it is array-like. Um, it is not a, a, a uniform array. You, you can have elements in the array that are of varying type. So an array doesn't have to have a uniform data type contained within it. And then there's the notion of sub-documents. So I have a person, the person has an address, an address has, you know, line one, line two, city, state, zip. That is an object that sits, a top level key is address, and within it there's sub-keys or something, if you want to call it. We call it a sub-document in Mongo, uh, and that could be an arbitrary object. Again, just a document. But what is important about this document structure is that Mongo actually understands those fields and values. Because they are BSON, because they are strongly typed, Mongo understands them, which means the query language can drill in and say, find me all people whose address, whose zip code in the address is X, or isn't X, or is in one of those sets, or things like that. So even though, from the outset, it looks kind of like a JSON document. Mongo has understanding of those fields. It's not like I took, say, an XML blob and shoved it into a column of nvarcar, you know, max or something, and then wanted to see something inside it, which I can't do in most database engines. So it's not a, a key OPEC blob engine. It does understand the document structure. But here's the mind twister. Those collections contain documents. And those documents can vary from each other completely. There is no overall schema that I had to declare. Did I have to say, hey, SVCC is this database. I'm going to have this collection? No. I just went in and I blurted, hey, imagine there's this collection called foo and insert this person with the name Bob. I didn't declare any schema. If I wanted to go back into this collection and insert another thing with no name field at all, it would accept it. And if I had some documents that had some fields in common, it would accept it. There is no relationship between one document and another within the same collection, which is very, very different from what relational databases do for us. We have to pre-declare schema there. Mongo does not require that. How many people think that's a good idea? How many people think it's a lousy idea that will bite us if we make documents that are very different from each other? How many people think that maybe with inheritance it allows us to do things like, you know, declare a basic invoice and then we have a business invoice that inherits from base invoice and then we have a personal invoice so we can have polymorphism within there, within the collection. I have documents that are specific to their use, but understood at a base level as their base type. Yeah, go do that with a table, right? You'd have to have a lot of relationships, maybe a column just for the type, and then because of the type, you, the program will have to think, oh, because of this type, I have to query fields A, B, C, but if it's not this type, I have to query X, Y, Z, or things like that. So that becomes difficult. With Mongo, it's a little easier. So schema, no schema. That's a little weird. Um, and uh, and that, that's kind of, you know, you have to wrap your mind around it, and you have to make a decision whether this is a good idea or not, right? Uh, definitely, if we come from a background of relational databases, that seems very weird, and that seems like it's extremely unsafe. How can we trust that our data is not dirty? I will ask, why do we assume that the data is dirty if it varies from each other, instead of assuming that it's so much richer because it has extra things that tell us more interesting stuff? It's a question of perspective. 
But I would say as a programmer, I like to think that when I query a document, I can trust that certain fields are there or not there. Whose responsibility is it? Is it the DBA that sat with me in the room before project initiation and designed this whole thing for hours on end? Or is it me as a program writer that says, this is how I model the world in my program, so I want to model it thusly in the database? I said it once, I'll say it again. Not here, I didn't say it yet. But I'm going to say, no SQL doesn't mean no DBA. However, the roles of the DBA uh, change a little bit because there is no built-in schema. So understanding what the ramifications of schema is something the developer needs to step up and understand and embrace and, and support better. And DBAs, I think, still have a good role in understanding the database engine internals and supporting it and advising on what is a good and appropriate schema and what is not. And certainly, over the years, it started with no rules whatsoever. The only rule for Mongo used to be that every document must have an ID. That rule still stands. Now you can actually add uh, a, a schema validation at the database level, preventing documents that do not adhere to a template from being inserted. So you can say that's schema enforcement. It's not actually schema enforcement in the same sense that the storage has enforced things to go into columns. It is schema gateway that says you are unable to write or m mutate a document unless it adheres to these rules. So nowadays there is more control given back to DBAs to be able to do it, um, but it's not mandatory. And there are ways to work around it too to, to circumvent that. So uh, we don't really have rigid schema, still don't. Uh, if you're looking for that, if that's what you must have for databases, uh, look for other products. There's also a rule around size, so you could imagine that I would just, you know, store a person's profile and their introductory video in their one document for the user because now it can all live together and it's flexible. Um, Mongo's like, eh, it's not so efficient for storage. If you want to store long, uh, large size uh, binary objects. There's a protocol for that. It's called GridFS, and it's geared towards using MongoDB as a file system. That's the FS file system. Um, documents have a limit of 16 megabytes. It used to be one meg, then it used to be four megs, and then they bumped it to 16, and they stopped, stopped updating that about five years ago. They're like, this should be enough. If you're getting anywhere near 16 megabytes, uh, give me a call, let's talk. Uh, you shouldn't. Uh, and the reasons for that are performance and storage. Um, it, it, it won't be, the engine won't be as efficient in storing, retrieving. Uh, you're gonna cram the wire with large documents. You're gonna consume a lot of memory when loading a document into memory, preventing concurrency from uh, enjoying uh, good time slicing and all because now everything is so much gigantic and juggling around. 16 megs is a lot, a lot. So we said um, documents can have strings, numbers, arrays, uh, date time, uh, it could be binary. I'm not gonna demonstrate binary but um, Let's, uh, let's look a little more at the document and make a little richer documents and interact with them. Yes, sir. The point about schema validation is that I can attach a kind of a template schema declaration to a collection and say, don't accept any rights to this collection unless the document adhered to that schema. That declaration can be partial, meaning I can say, I insist that every document in the user collection have a social security number, and it has, you know, three, four, two, I forget, oh, nine digits or whatever, right? I can do that, but leave the rest of the fields or the rest of the potential fields untouched, or I can say, I insist that there's exactly only these fields.
So let's uh, look at some more demo, do a little more with, um, with documents. Um, dismiss this. Go back here. Sorry about that. So uh, show DBs. I have something. Where am I? DB. I'm in SVCC. Uh, show collections. Show me which collections I have. A, I have a collection demo. Um, so DB dot peeps dot insert. Uh, somebody with the ID of one, and um, with the name of uh, Kim. Okay, uh, and I can say, hey, uh, how about I'll insert somebody with the name Bob. Oh, Mongo has a schema rule. Everyone ha must have an ID, and if I say insert another document with the same ID, it's going to barf at me. Duplicate key. It barfed at me because of that key. If I said insert Kim again, same difference, right? Which somebody might ask, well, how do I get an automatic ID? Uh, you don't. Mongo, the server, does not provide for a sequence. It doesn't have a sequence column like uh, Oracle. It doesn't have a identity column like SQL Server. Uh, there's no declaration that gives you automatic dispensing of IDs. What you can do if you need IDs for your application is use a, a GUID or a UUID-like object. Mongo volunteers its own. It's called an um, object ID. And an object ID is a 24-byte structure that is GUID-like. It has some other properties. Object IDs are roughly incrementing. I spoke for 10 seconds. It's going to be a little different. Look at the last digits there. It has a component that is a timestamp with some granularity, but it also has other components that are tied to the MAC address and hardware and things, and some random component and some sequential component, which means that on the same machine, if you're generating two object IDs, they're not going to collide, uh, and there's going to be some global uniqueness to it, too. So if you wanted to create IDs that are roughly ascending, object ID is your friend. Otherwise, you could use GUIDs. There's something called a COM um, algorithm that generates UUIDs that have this roughly ascending property as well. Um, um, so, yeah, so choose your language, choose your uh, idea. If you really want numbers that are incrementing, you would have to create your own sequence number and take a hit, basically, going, checking out the next number, using it, and so forth. So there's overhead in that. Which means that if I wanted to insert a document with no ID whatsoever, what would happen? Sorry? Barf? True, it did. So in my first demo, it didn't barf at me. So let's find a document, db.peeps find. And I say, I see Kim that I actually inserted with an explicit ID, and I see Og that was inserted without an explicit ID. If I insert Og again, it's not going to barf at me because absent an ID, somebody's assigning an ID. It's not MongoD the server, it's actually the driver or the program inside the shell that does it for me here. And most language drivers have a feature to say auto assign an ID. You can shoot it, you know, an invoice, and without an invoice ID, but you say I, invoice ID is the underscore ID, and it automatically generates for you a GUID or an object ID or something of choice. Uh, in fact, the JavaScript 
uh, shell, the shell is JavaScript. Therefore, if I look at the prototype of insert, this is a JavaScript trick. I do this without the parentheses. Uh, and I read through all of this. Somewhere it says, ah, if you don't have an ID, if it's undefined, then why don't you set the ID of the object to a new object ID for me? Ha ha, okay? So it did this for me behind the scenes. Mongo, the server, does not dispense IDs. Fair enough? Cool. So um, uh, let's see. So let's insert someone with uh, ID, ID uh, two and uh, name. Let's not do name, age. Uh, 42, Mongo's quite happy, db.peeps.find shows me a bunch of documents. You can see the variety, not everybody has a name, right? Um, I can have one where I have another ID here, three, and the age is, or let's say the name, is uh, 33. Again, variety. Name is a label on that document. From document to another, there is no relationship. There is no predefined schema. It can be whatever I want. So these are different types. Here, 33 is a number, and uh, the name is a number, and somewhere else it is a string. Let's try an array. Um, let's, uh, let's into food, insert um, ID one, name taco, um, uh, categories will be say spicy and uh, yummy. Is this how you spell yummy? I don't know. Like so? Almost palindrome. So this is great. So now I have an array, db.food find. I have this document that has a string. It also has an array. If I wanted to find foods that um, are yummy, I can say db.find. Um, I'm sorry, db.food, find, and this is query by example here, so I'm saying anywhere where the cat has a value of yummy. And it returns it. And if I have uh, one that's sweet, our one taco, it happens to not be sweet. This looks intuitive or a little oh, weird. So if I said, hey, give me the one with the name taco, obviously it's the one with the name equal taco. So this colon here in the find between cat and the value means equal, right? But when you have an array, MongoDB treats it as a set. So it's trying to prove that the document that it returns adheres to, it has that in there. So when I say, find me one with the category spicy or the category yummy, it's saying, find me one where if this is an array, it better have an element that matches that. Make sense? Well, so, I have this, uh, I want to now change this a bit. So I have a taco, um, maybe I want to say well, what kind of food is it? Is it like street food or restaurant food? So I want to maybe add a decoration to this item and I want to modify an existing document. So when I want to modify an existing document, I need to supply it two things. One. Which documents should I change? And second, what is the change I want to 
uh, enact on the document. db.food update. And the first thing I need to say is which documents should I apply this to? Uh, how about the one with the name taco? And the second is, what do I want to do to it? Um, should we maybe call it a street taco? So I want to say dollar set. Dollar means an operator here. So I want to set a field. I want to set the field name to street taco. If you notice underneath it says number matched, number upserted, and number modified. Number matched is how many documents adhered to the spec. Number upserted is an upsert, that's a way to do an update but create a document if it doesn't exist. Number modified is number of documents that were modified. Uh, why is number modified change from, different from number matched? It is the same in this case, but are there cases where it's not going to be the same? Oh, so one is maybe it failed to modify it. Even simpler, if it found that the document already contains this value, I would modify it too. It walks away. It says my work is done here. And that saves on I.O., so that's efficiency. So that's actually a good thing. Uh, you want to have this feature where if there's nothing to do, the engine is like, okay, I'm done. It'll report cheerfully that it's done. So this is the case where if I found one that is street taco, and I ch set its name to street taco, number modified is zero. All right? What if I wanted to manipulate the array? Right? So maybe my taco, now identified as street taco, um, I want to do something and uh, maybe remove spicy from the array because on its own, the taco has no spiciness. It's actually the salsa you put on top. So I can say dollar pull uh, am I gonna get it right? Uh, pull from cat the value of spicy. And pray to the god of close parentheses. All right, so now I pulled it out. I can also say, no, no, it was quite spicy, push. So it's back in again. I can also say add to set. Remember, arrays can be used as set or as a sequence. Notice one was matched, but none was modified because spicy already exists in the array, right? So I can say cool. The first time it will add it. Subsequent times, nothing would happen. Cool was only added once. If I happened to do it with push, Uh, I'll add another spicy. It will happily do that, and I'll end up with duplicates in there. All right? So, dear diary, uh, we can modify a document. We need to give it a document spec, a find, a match, which document or documents should I update. And then it needs a spec for what is the update to apply and it will evaluate who is a candidate, do I need to change anything, 
If so, make the change, report back. Make sense? DB dot peeps find. So I have all of these people. I can update them. I'll update them with the empty query. It means I want to change all of them. And I will say set the, uh, say, age to uh, 18. Good. Uh, hey, 21, why not be able to drink? Number matched, one, upserted, none, modified one. What's happening here? Um, okay, so fair enough. Uh, DB dot peeps dot find. Uh, one of them got modified. If I apply this again, it kind of caught one of them and said I have nothing to update. But it's not because the field existed. It's because by default, it's trying to do fat finger protection and not destroy my collection by doing what I actually asked it to do. Uh, so if I want to affect multiple documents, I can supply an option, say, upsert one or true. Change syntax, sorry. So uh, in this case here, as you can see at the, oh, I just deleted it. Uh, let's change it to something else. Uh, it matched multiple documents and updated all of them. I do it again. Matched multiple documents and updated none of them because the value pre-existed. So, yes, sir? Did they all have age before? No, they did not. Only one of them had age initially. Right. So did you add age to all of them? This update, since I used the syntax of set, added a field. If I want to remove a field, there's a dollar on set. So the set operator created that field. Yeah, so the question is, why didn't it say upsert for? After all, the field didn't exist. That's because upsert refers to the existence of a document, not to existence of fields with documents. So the way um, upsert works is that I can say update the one with ID uh, 11, set the let's say name, to L. Yeah, I watch Netflix. Um, if I do this, if I do this and say, upsert true, The first case, it failed because there, it didn't exist, it didn't match anything. The second one, I said, I want you to update that document, but I want you to use upsert semantics, meaning create if not exist. In which case, the whole change spec will become a create spec, and a document with that would exist. Which is very important, because if I had, um, we, we want to use the surgical update because if I had a document there with, say, name and age, and somebody else also sets on it a, I don't know, a decoration, a uh, award, right? But client A doesn't have the notion of award, so if it just updates the whole field with all the values, it will slam the awards away. Make sense? I'm not explaining it well. So uh, db.foo.insert uh, id of one and name of 
uh, Bob. Right, so I have Bob. And then somebody says, well, let's, sorry. DB, yeah, dot foo dot update. I only have one person there, right? ID is one. And I say name, Bob, and age, uh, something. I can do that, right? But what if there's another client who wants to add another field? They are not aware of the name. They're just trying to update an age. If they did a non-surgical update and they omitted, let's say not the name, they omitted the age, but they wanted to award uh, SVCC champ. So that's totally possible. But what's going to ensue is that the age is gone. When you use the surgical update, the dollar operator, to set a specific field, it sets that specific field. If in the update spec you give it a full document, which is kind of the custom of people doing RESTful interfaces, they ship the whole document and they shove the whole document back in, you will have concurrency problems. You would not know that the database already had an extra field, age, and you would just slam it away. That document from now and forever lost the age. So this is why you want to use the surgical operators, the set field, unset field. There's also increment a number so I can um, say uh, dollar well, actually, I, can, I cannot mix surgical and non-surgical, but I can say here, uh, dollar increment the field age by one. db.foo.find, I have age of three, I issued increment three times. And that operation is thread safe, it's the server receives the command, says, what's the age now? Add one to it, go. Yes, sir. Because five is a value of a field, Upsert refers to the existence of the document as a whole. So it reports that a field was upserted when you used, um, w when the match did not match any document, but you said upsert true, it will create a document if it didn't exist. Then it will report upserted. It, if you didn't say, I want to use upsert semantics, upsert equals true, it won't report upserted ever. It will forever be zero. Correct. Correct. All right. We are kind of over time. I will um, more or less return to where we were, uh, just to kind of orient ourselves to where we were. We saw what a document is. We saw starting off uh, Mongo from scratch. We connected to it. We learned about documents. We saw funny memes. We, um, there's more you can do with find. I didn't get to it. I just did exact match. But obviously, it has less than, greater than, things like that. For arrays, it has element matches, which says a array element with multiple fields must match and not just a single field in there. So you can have rich documents within arrays. Um, there's sorting, allowing you to obviously take the one with the highest number, lowest number, so forth, alphabetical sorting. Um, there are projections, so you have a big fat document with a lot of fields, but you only want two fields out of it, so that's select, you know, first name, comma, last name kind of thing. So that's what projection is. You say which fields you want returned, um, so that's more efficient over the wire. And uh, many, many other um, 
other uh, features. Um, update and slam update, we just saw. Surgical operators start with dollar, slam, you give it a whole document. Uh, concurrency is solved by using um, uh, dollar operators. Upsert, we've seen. And multi, I also showed you where if you want to affect multiple documents in one fell swoop, you can issue a single command that will touch multiple documents. So the match spec does not have to guarantee that only one document matches, right? Uh, in terms of speed of MongoDB, it is fast. How fast? Oh, very fast. Well, uh, there's a whole uh, day worth of uh, class we can do on schema design and designing for scalability. Um, in general, Mongo is fast. It supports indexes, and indexes can look into uh, subfields. So you can index array elements. Uh, therefore, uh, the engine and the operators understand the structure of the document. It's supported by index, so it's fast. It's not like you have some JSON blob and you have to actually read it into memory and spelunk it. Uh, it's pretty fast. Another element of speed is um, uh, the, the document design. Uh, the document design itself, how you model your objects can affect your performance tremendously. So that's something uh, worth learning. Um, unfortunately, unlike relational databases, we don't have uh, 40 years worth of experience and uh, academia books written about it. Mongo is fairly young. So the how should we do things and how to optimize is still a, a growing business. Uh, and, and we discover things as they become available. There are some guidelines. Uh, but but uh, mostly it's uh, experimentation using tooling like explain like query planner to understand how the schema you chose affects your operational data store and then tuning as necessary um, there's also if you need to bulk insert and stuff like that there's a way to ship a whole bunch of insert commands uh, which is more efficient than one by one uh, so if you are doing data loads, please look into bulk operations. And the most efficient of that is the unordered bulk, uh, meaning that any of those can be inserted. That gives the engine the uh, biggest opportunity to parallelize. Uh, WebScale, the namesake of this T-shirt. Um, Mongo uh, supports two things that help you in the modern age. One is resiliency, the ability to recover in the face of a single node failure is uh, implemented through replica sets where you have a uh, one node that is writable and copies of the data across secondaries. That is for uptime and durability. If somebody poured a bucket of water on your primary, the secondaries have all the data, therefore your data is safe. It also means that when your application is running, if the primary fell, another one will take its place and step up automatically, <clears throat> which means at 3 a.m. you do not have to wake up and do anything. It recovers automatically. Sharding is the way to scale out. Sharding, I'm not going to demo because we're way out of time, uh, takes one collection space chops it into horizontal pieces and distribute them among uh, various nodes. You can use it to eke more out of commodity hardware, or you can use it because your data set is so large that a single machine cannot process enough writes in time. Therefore, you invest in more machinery and spread the load across them. So that's charging. Um, yeah, that's my replica set. Uh, we don't have time to go into it. Um, and then sharding is really not so much changing the container on the engine. It is a way to distribute the work among several uh, MongoDB servers such that your client doesn't even know. Uh, the lady asked what Mongo S is. The clients connect to Mongo S and it does the routing. <coughs> so a client does not know really or care whether it connected to a single MongoD or to a whole cluster. 
That's all the time we have. Um, if any of you want to learn more, I have some uh, free months on plural sites, so you can check out courses, mine or other there. And uh, thank you for coming. I will take questions, but I, out of respect to your time, if anybody needs to go, please feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you.